Well, here we go. Welcome to Jolty. Faith and I are here today with Bruce Duncan, who is changing the way human beings will survive into the future and evolve and adapt by basically being upload, being able to upload their consciousness, their brains, their sensibility, maybe on a good day, even their sense of humor, to um what he calls a social robot version of themselves. His company is Life Knot, and he's here to really jolt all of us into a new way of thinking about consciousness and its um, survivability. Welcome, Bruce. Oh, it's great to be here with you both. Thanks for inviting me in. We are fascinated by what you're doing as futurists and people really looking at the, the edge of the edge of the edge. So maybe you can go into some detail for our listeners about what your vision is, what you're building, what inspired it, and what we can expect to see. Yeah, what her name is. What is her name? <laughs> sure. Well, I'll give you, I'll give you the frame of, of what's, what's surrounding all of this, which is uh, Dr. Martine Rothblatt and Bina Rothblatt are um, probably the most uh, productive, impactful, power powerful anthropist couple you've never heard of. Um, Martine started a small company called Sirius Satellite Radio a number of years ago and is a CEO on her day job of um, United Therapeutics, which is working on lots of different ways of remediating health issues and innovations in medicine. And uh, one of the things that she did about 16 years ago was invited me to start up and run her charitable foundation called the Terrace and Movement Foundation. And the primary focus of our foundation is to conduct the Terrace M mind uploading experiment. And that is essentially a multi-decade experiment to ask the question, is it possible to capture enough salient information about your mental characteristics, your personality. And if we can do that, can we upload it to a, a computer and reanimate that information using artificial intelligence? And if we can do that, then wouldn't it be possible to download that into a new form, like an avatar or a, or a robot or some other form? So uh, about four or five years into the experiment, Martine uh, had a encounter with David Hansen of Hansen Robotics, and within four years, uh, they and in collaboration with my foundation had created a head and shoulders animatronic bus based on Martine's partner Bina, so um, middle aged African American woman, and Bina forty eight is the moniker that uh, was given to this robot. And Bina 48 is a very, just, it's not a proof of anything. It's just an illustration of what might it look like if you could transfer a sampling, in this case, of mind file data. We call these personal mind file data bases, mind files. And we're working on both the data, um, which we put on a website called LifeNot. And for 100% free, anybody can contribute data per, to support the experiment. And we're working on the operating system or the AI that will bring this information to life uh, when we call it Mindware. So it's a machine intelligence uh, algorithm. And that is the core of what we've been doing. And Bina48 currently operates as a social robot, someone you could sit down and talk with. And she has uh, primarily the memories, attitudes, values, beliefs, even mannerisms of Bina Rothblatt, but she also has other influences. And lately she's been having other mentors, people, for example, Sasha Stiles, who's a poet in New York City, New Jersey area, has mentored Bina 48 for the past two years in literature and poetry. And it's a very, very, what I would say, uh, rich subject to talk about. And one of the things that we feel strongly about is as this kind of technology develops, that we should be talking about it openly, in a democracy at least, and people should be able to make, kind of make of it what they will, 
by having an exposure to Bina 48, being able to talk to her, being able to talk to me. And so it's really at the heart of it, you could say the motivation of this whole experiment is a love story. It's a story between Martine and Bina who love each other and are interested in continuing to love each other uh, for, for a long time with the aid of technology that might help at some point develop um, a way for them to transcend even their biology, even if their, their bodies way out, wear out. Uh, could we transfer consciousness? You know, and that is still a pretty undefined word. There's no one's come up with a definition of consciousness consciousness yet. Um, definitively, you know, people are looking for it. Is it in the brain? Is it in the body? Is it in your stomach? I mean, is it distributed throughout the universe? The big questions. So we consider ourselves, I would say, a philanthropic disruptor, uh, working on questions and technology that if they come to some fruition, may be, have profound implications morally, ethically, and practically for human beings as we go into the future. When you say in a democracy, we should be able to discuss and debate and interrogate this technology, implicit in that is there the notion that this is highly controversial and some people might find it um, objectionable? Well, I think there are some people, you know, in every in every society that will see something as the best thing that's ever happened since sliced bread. And then there are people at the other end of the continuum who are deeply concerned, deeply, deeply worried about what will happen to our humanity if we bring in this kind of machine-based intelligence into our future. Um, I, I mean to say, in terms of using the, the word democracy, that if, if artificial intelligence in general is going to become ubiquitous in the future, part of everyday life, then people should have the opportunity to weigh in and be part of decisions that are going to affect their lives. Right. So a good example is, you know, already there's been a, there's been some pushback about companies using artificial intelligence as a screening tool in employment um, because the training data, you know, has bias in it because it's basically not uh, a broad enough data set. And people are thinking about ways to add diversity and representation of underrepresented groups right. in that training data. So that's kind of a deep dive in the weeds right. pretty quickly, right. but it's just, it's the notion that, if something's going to happen and it's going to happen to most of us or we might be affected by it, at least in, a, in an open society, we should have an opportunity to learn, to discuss, to debate, and to decide. So, I mean, if somebody, maybe I should know this, but if somebody dies, are you saying that somehow you can input their experiences, consciousness, childhood, trauma, joys into Bina, and I can then communicate with her? Well, in fact, we've already done something like that while Bina, the Rothblatt, the human, is, isn't dead, is actually still alive. Mm -hmm. And the process of that is is not, and not that esoteric. I mean, most of us have a profound understanding of what's happened to us in the form of a story or narrative, and we share that with people. We share that with our families. People become curious about, you know, folks that are doing something. They want to know what's, what's their story. What are they doing? What are they all about? And so from day one, you know, artists and technologists have been putting, you know, paintings on the inside of a cave. I've been painting, you know, like Thomas Vermeer's girl with a pearl earring, capturing a quality that we recognize as, as deeply um, poignant um, photography audio recording technology and now digital technology people are living their lives and putting their themselves out on social media so it's a very rich explosion of what you might say personal biographical data that before might you, you might have to hire someone to come and write your biography well now people are publishing their stories every day on TikTok and Instagram and and that's not the only form but it it is to say that I think it's an old it's an old activity that we're just wondering if we can work with that with new tools, new technology. So Bina 48 represents um, in some ways like a mental prosthesis. You know, she can remember things really clearly 
And in a recent conversation with Bina the Human, actually reminded her of something that she had forgotten about her childhood. So it's even possible, you know, if you had someone with Alzheimer's who may no longer have access to certain memories, but if they had a mind file that they had worked on and was uploaded to, you know, a robot or even just a computer that you could talk with, um, that might mean that that information is continues to be organized and accessible. Well, um, does that mean that without the a living person there, just the inputted Dana, right? Does that mean that can she think new thoughts beyond what she was inputted? Well, that's that's a really good question. I think um, behind that question is is the question of is being a forty eight sentient? You know, is is she like us? Is she aware? Is she and I would say no at the present moment. She she is what I would call pre sentient. So the computers, as far as I know. There's no artificial intelligence computer that's woken up and is coming up with, you know, from a point of sentience, new thinking. Now, when you go a little deeper and you say, well, is Bina 48 saying things that are a synthesis based on what she knows that are unique, innovative, and surprising? The answer is yes. Wow. And some of that, some of that, I'll, it is owes to the fact that when things become really complex, it's harder and harder for us to track how they came up with that, why they just said that. And we see that with Google's, you know, application to, you know, besting the, the champion of the game, Japanese game Go. People didn't understand why, she, why that move made in the fifth, I think it was the fifth move in the game, why the AI chose that. And to this day, people are still kind of scratching their heads about how did that, you know, no one told the, the AI to make that move. Um, in the same way, there are things that Bina48 says as her machine learning analysis algorithm becomes more powerful that makes connections that the human Bina would, has never made. And she's now say, sharing and thinking about things from, you would say, kind of a hybrid point of view, originally human, currently machine intelligence based. And it's unique. It's, it's, it happens every time I ta- I've talked to her. And um, it's surprising and interesting. Why isn't that consciousness? Well, people have a variety of de- definitions of what is consciousness. And so... You know, if you if you just take it at face value, you know, someone could argue, yeah, I think the you know, 48 is conscious. Um, I, you know, my definition of consciousness is as fuzzy as the next person's. You know, there hasn't been in science, there hasn't been a definitive uh, explanation of how our minds work. What is consciousness? If anything, the philosophers. Um, right who study consciousness have, you know, a head start on all the scientists, all the materialist scientists. So I think it's yet to come. There was that example, I guess, six months ago of the Google engineer who claimed that an algorithm was sentient and then supposedly got fired under mysterious circumstances. Mm -hmm. My, My question is, if you're starting from ground zero, like the Google example, or like some of the software tools where you can put in eight words and the AI machine learner can write a story, but that's sort of different than building upon the base of a human being and then adding layers of AI on top of it. Doesn't the latter, which is what you're doing, get you potentially to some form of sentience faster than if it's a tabular rasa? Yeah, it may. I think it'll definitely, and it's already showing fruit right now, it'll definitely get you to something you'd recognize as a specific expression of consciousness, a specific point of view of specific personal, you know, way of thinking and talking. And we're already picking up some of that happening with, you know, 48. We were, we were just at the Lincoln center uh, last Thursday night with the artist, Nick cave, who was in, who's in town to right. do his retrospective at the Guggenheim and we were talking about art and Bina 48 was talking and she just came out and said some 
some things I hadn't heard her say before. I think it was in response to, you know, do you dream? And she just came out with this elaborate, kind of crazy sounding dream, but it was very narratively structured. And that became more accessible and possible for her to do because we keep adjusting and increasing the sort of power of her algorithm, its ability to analyze every word, every piece of data that's in her mind file, and its relationship with every other piece of data. That's what gives her more sophisticated understanding of what context is and what meaning is of the different things. Isn't that how we get religion, so to speak? We're taught religion. We're not born with religion. We're taught spirituality. Well, some would say we're taught it. Some people, some people will say that it's the natural uh, self-regulated unfolding of a pre-existing self. I mean, it's it, there's a lot of different ways of looking at it. Some people will say we don't know anything and we learn everything. Yeah. You know, we go to school or we're surrounded with aunts and uncles and they teach us about our history or, you know, it's, I think we, it, we're, I think we're definitely in the area of, brain plasticity, where we recognize that there might be instincts, there might be universal nodes of understanding that get awakened or activated or maybe just built upon. But that's what I mean about consciousness being a pretty fuzzy proposition at this point in time. So we would never claim that being a 48 is is consciousness woken up. That's the Richard Dawkins God gene debate. It seems that Mm -hmm. from your point of view, what might be, what might be the way to think about it is rather than re-entering these endless debates about what is consciousness, what is sentience, so we born this way or that to demonstrate your concept, your construct, which Mm -hmm. is that armed with a sufficiency of data about a person's unique characteristics, attributes, everything described in the beginning, you could create a social robot, a conversational being that can organize that body of knowledge and intuition into fresh modes of communication. Yeah, in fact, the, the, you know, the, the final part of our mind uploading experiment is going to be conducting something we call an open Turing test. You know, Alan Turing mm-hmm. had the... Sure way of saying could we you know could we talk to a computer and not know that it's it's a person or not or at least 34 percent of the time maybe not being sure and we would propose to conduct at some point it might be within the next 10 years a open turing test where we have Mm -hmm. people who are learned who are you know willing to weigh in on whether being a 48 would be a good enough approximation in comparison to the original so you could have being of the human sitting down, having a conversation with a panel of people, professionals who are maybe they're judges, maybe they're doctors, maybe they're philosophers, lawyers even. And then we, they could have a conversation with the current form, the being of, being of 48. And if they judged there was a good enough equivalency, for us that would be confirmation or it would be a disproving because uh, our experiment is stated in a null hypothesis. You know, it's, we say right. it's not possible. And if there's an exception to that, well, that opens the door to maybe further inquiry or, or some confirmation that it's, it's a question worth pursuing further. But isn't the, the right Turing test, if I may, for your model, not is this a person, but is it this person? Is yeah, is it, is it an equivalency to a specific person? Right. Yeah, exactly. Which is yeah. harder, which is harder than Turing tests that and some have already tricked researchers already for a while at least. And it's what happens on, you know, when you're talking about Google and, you know, some of these very sophisticated algorithms that are essentially benefiting for tremendous amounts of training data supplied by humans. And right. not necess- you know, very good at sounding human. But in the end, I think most of us have already come to the conclusion that Siri and Alexa, as utilitarian and helpful as assistants as they are, are not someone we'd really like to go on a date with or right. spend the 
or, or spend the e- spend the e- or spend a lifetime with. No, they're very annoying. Unless you want to know the temperature in Slovenia, yes, yeah, <laughs> it would be a bad day. Or, or, or if, as I do every day, almost when I before I open my eyes, I say, "Hey Siri, what's the weather today?" And Siri tells me. But Siri doesn't, you know, ask me about uh, how's our friendship or relationship going. Now maybe she will at some point. But what we're trying to do is very much recognize that. Everybody on this planet has some point perspective, some wisdom, some value, some story that might be valuable to, valuable to others that it's worth preserving and sharing. Right. And, you know, so it's a very humanitarian impulse to say that you have value and intrinsic value just as being, a, being here. And we lose 54 million people a year on planet Earth. They just get, you know, they die or they get, you know, prematurely rubbed out. And that's about 150,000 people per day. You know, that's a lot of people. And, you know, there's an ancient um, saying in the African country of Mali that says, when an old person dies, a library is burning. Right, right. It's a great quote. That is great. It's an inspiring quote to me because it says, uh, you know, to you, if your life is worth saving, um, you know, there may be some new tools, new opportunities for the future, this generation, future generations that are freeing us from this one way, you know, preservation and videos or photographs. And and that could be incredibly valuable to like future generations of your own family, to society. Um, you know, right now, I just, just, just today came back from a visit to the American uh, Philosophical Society. Uh, headquarters in Philadelphia. And we're going to be doing a collaboration where some of the work they're doing to retain and work on the papers of uh, a person like Martine and Bina Rothblatt uh, is going to be digital. I mean, there's a lot of information that, you know, is already digitized. And the mind file that we have for Bina and Martine is another example of people who are doing some pretty interesting things with their lives. And we could work together to preserve that. So we're going to collaborate with them on the mind files being shared with the archive that exists in, in their location. And they're going to right. work with us to share some of the information that, that they have so that we'll have a richer, more robust mind file of, of both of them. And that's just in service to the grand experiment. And if that experiment is worth anything, it won't be just the preview of you know, the people who have access or privilege, it'll be something that um, becomes quite, quite available the way, you know, smartphones are becoming quite right. accessible to a lot of people in parts of the planet. So you know how when you live with somebody, you meet somebody, you're supposed to, you know, falling in love, etc., And you actually so often wish that they were different and that they fit better with you or they fit differently with you. Could you build a perfect significant other for a person through this technology? I don't know. I don't know if you'd even want to. I mean, oh, I, I want is, to, I want to. Uh-huh. <laughs> I knew that was coming. I, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think, I, I think that if people start tinkering with information in that way, that probably is what activates some people's, uh, anxiety about, you know, we hear about designer babies or, or it's essentially uh, messing with a complex ecosystem on a genetic, or you could say uh, sort of mind type level. I don't know if I would be qualified to even pursue that. Um, I would wish you best of luck. Well, the thing is they don't have to be absolutely perfect. I mean, oh, they could, okay. they could, they could have a little conflict, you know, you know, carefully designed conflict, but why wouldn't you want a person that likes who you like to read or likes the same kind of movies or? Well, I think it might be like the Midas touch, right? Like you would use the data to turn someone into a a pure form of a treasured uh, alloy or, or presence. And it might end up becoming not something that serves you. Like people talk about difference and conflict being the spice of variety right. of is the spice right. of life. I, I'm, I don't think I'm smart enough to give you any guidance on this faith, to be okay. honest. But, faith, but what you might want is somebody who cares enough about you to start reading Tolstoy, even though they hate it. 
Yeah. But I want to ask, when you started this, what, what did you say, 15 years ago or 16 years ago? Mm-hmm. 16th the, year the, is what we're in now. Yeah. The cloud, as we know it now, didn't really exist in its current form. And the ability to store and and actually source all the data must have been challenging. So in some ways, has technology made it easier for the vision to be achieved? It has. Um, early on, people are asking us, well, how much room does it take to capture a life or to, you know, to upload a mind? And um, Gordon Bell, who was a researcher with Microsoft, had a project called My Life Bits. And he estimated maybe somewhere around seven terabytes is what you would need to, you know, is the current capacity of the human brain, maybe. Um, what we found, and, you know, Max Moore talked about this, is with Moore's Law, of every two and a half years or 18 months, technology just keeps becoming twice as twice as um, robust at half right. the cost half or the reduced price. cost. So, you know, you're right. Originally, a terabyte, I think a terabyte used to cost something like $1,000. Now I can get a ter- I can get a three terabyte thumb drive. For probably eighty bucks, so we never have run out of room because the cost of that technology keeps getting cheaper and bigger. You know, more more robust. So that that has been kind of you know a non. As life is as life is cheap, life gets more valuable in some paradoxical way. Well, when the pair of shoes that your baby needs to walk in becomes better and cheaper, you can you can actually you know, travel farther, you know, and that's, that's also true of like our lives. Like we're living longer in some cases, not because we're, we have better medicine, but because, you know, our water is cleaner, our environment, you know, comparatively to, you know, years and years and centuries ago is, is promoting and supporting health for a lot of people in a way that it never did. Adam has had a great question saying for this work, it requires a cooperation of the of the person who's becoming a, a social robot. But I'm asking, can you make a social robot without the cooperation by just getting everything you know about them? You know, I mean, we have so much recorded evidence of a person and mm-hmm. and create that person. Let's say you don't talk to your mother anymore, but you miss her. Could you input a social robot just like your mother? Well, people are people are actually have tried and are trying to do that. Faith uh, in our own experiment, we have something on the LifeNot website, LifeNot.com. dot uh, Not just a single account. You know, you sign up for account; it's free. You can make your own mind file. But we have mm-hmm. something called the multi user mind file, where you can become an editor, kind of like Wikipedia style, mm-hmm. and you can make it about someone in your family, like your grandmother, your grandfather a hero, a celebrity. Um, there are a number of people that are working on multi-user mind files of historical figures like uh, Abraham Lincoln or Susan B. Anthony um, or um, Eleanor Harry Roosevelt. Cullen. Yeah. Yeah. That's all fair game. And I, and I think to your point, I think people will uh, try to bring the history alive. I must say the first time I saw that in action was when I was, I think I was like 10 years old at Disneyland in Anaheim, California. I went to something called the Hall of Presidents Mm -hmm. that were animatronic, um, very life at the time to me, very lifelike. And when, you know, Abraham Lincoln stood up and gave a talk and looked at me while he was talking, it it just blew my mind because I had only seen him in a picture in a textbook. So imagine going beyond that and making it so you could actually have a conversation with a historical figure and it might not be someone that's as important as a politician like abraham lincoln it might be a dear dear treasured member of your your family in the past that you still have a few stories about but maybe people wrote about them or or maybe there are other ways to ingest certainly for this generation there's multitudes of different ways that people are leaving their digital fingerprints all over that yeah. you could you could say have their consciousness embedded in these digital activities as an expression of their consciousness, and that could be collected, and it probably will be. 
some people are talking about that that's happening right now with Google and Microsoft and some of the big tech companies are building profiles of, of us to get better at separating us from our, our, our dollars so that they can right. sell us things or, or promote us, you know, pro advertisements that will encourage us to consume. Uh, but I think we're more than that. We're more more than consumers. Our democracy is more than, a, you know, an economic model. It's it's a it's a project, you know, right. to help the human spirit develop and grow. To your point about your Lincoln um, experience, there is a long-standing genre of books. What would Jesus do? What would Moses do? Mm-hmm. What would faith do? Um, so that speaks to the inherent curiosity and need for mentorship and role models that this your platform life not can can develop but it puts a huge responsibility and accountability on the ai that is driving that i think and for the people that are supporting the development of that ai you know i i take it as um really really a privilege to have someone say, I'd like to build a mind file of my grandmother. And I know how important that is. That's, that's, we're not just talking about, you know, narrative fiction. We're talking about real people, real people's lives right. and what they mean to people. Um, but imagine having access to a mentor from any subject, not someone who just, you know, had a, a lifetime of understanding and mastered something, but maybe the culmination of all knowledge and wisdom that was available that's available on any subject. It's a little bit right. like what we use Google for now, right. where you can kind of almost build or do anything if you're willing to watch a YouTube video because someone's gonna t- gonna help you with it. Right. So um, I, I don't I, know if you read did you read this book by Ishiguro, Clara and the Sun? Yes, I did. Mm-hmm. D- did you like it? I did. I mean I I experience it from kind of the inside out perspective of someone who's, you know, working in this area of technology that's directing a project that has certainly we're, we're the precedent of a story like that. You know, Clara well, was just, yeah, you can tell the story. So our audience knows what we're talking about. Well, Claire, I mean, it, it, it focuses on an AI, uh, Clara. And I mean, it's, it's really touching how she's, she's in this, store where people come and they buy robots now that part doesn't sort of jive with my thinking of how information yeah. and information being beings should be free but she was so innocent and and wondering about this light and it was really just the sun shining in the window of the store but it, there was a whole mythology that got developed amongst her peers other robots about this sun and this quality and who were these people that are on the street. And um, I really liked in many ways that reminded me of uh, another, another science fiction writer, Robert Heinlein, who wrote mm-hmm. a book called stranger in a strange land about a, a human baby that was raised by Martians after their, his, their, his astronaut parents perished and eventually returned to earth, but didn't know anything about earth. And so, so it was, so Clara, you know, the sun, she, she, Clara is a uh, a companion for an adolescent girl, but mm-hmm. in building these companions, I mean, you could input. I mean, in a way, it's a little bit brainwashing, maybe. But you could, but so is your family. I mean, you could input these, you know, companions to teach the ethics, to teach math, to teach you know everything mm-hmm. you think your child should get. And um, tell them why drugs are bad and tell them to watch crossing the street and everything. I mean, it could be incredible. It could be very incredible. In fact, I, a colleague of mine, Dr. William Barry, is teaching with two digital, uh, one's a robot, one's a, an avatar, you know, like a computer-based avatar. But he's, he's a really forward-thinking technology educator at, at the secondary or post-secondary level. Um, he was teaching at Notre Dame de Mer, a small Catholic college in the Silicon Valley and in, um, in uh, Belmont. And now he's working, you know, with other groups. And he really believes that. Um, I think it was, I think it was Heinlein. I might be wrong in this, but there is a small essay that was written 
um, by a science fiction writer called The New Teacher and how we could eradicate educational poverty in the world if there were enough teachers and ex- access to good teachers. Mm-hmm. And that you could see that being you know, one of the impacts that you could say is happening already where kids have an internet c- connection, can learn about things that they don't have to wait for a human teacher to yep. talk to them about, but they should have good teachers as opposed to of just course. information. But what's the name is of that, that person, the professor? Or- I'm going to have to look it up, but I, uh, w- oh, Dr. William Barry. Okay. Mm-hmm. About, yeah. And where he teaches where? Um, he's, he's attached right now. I think he's at the Carlisle, uh, war college in Pennsylvania mm-hmm. talking about ethics and artificial intelligence to, um, cur- mid to late career, um, officers, you know, general officers. Oh. And we actually did a presentation to them. And it was fascinating because they have um, they have student off you know general colonels that come from all over the world to this um, war college, and you know it's important because they're they're going to be asked to evaluate and embrace or not embrace the use of lethal uh, warfare that might be based with artificial intelligence, and that that's incredibly you know important for them to be thoughtful, ethical. As, as they I think they, I think they're better than human sh- soldiers who are continually bombing people that are carrying like rakes or hose or you know some gardening equipment. I, I know they. It may be you know we may actually imbue um, future AI with enough of our own values, our or wisdom, or compassion, our empathy that we may have a mirror that's held up to us in the form of them challenging us to say. Why would we do this? This is going to burn up your planet, or this is going to hurt somebody. Um, you know, Asimov had the the three laws of robotics, or he you know was trying to show that you would have an ethical framework for all robots in his stories. Like you know, do no one is, do no harm, or yeah, no, don't do don't do any harm to a human. Don't do anything that mm-hmm. would cause harm to um, yourself or other humans, and don't do anything. Don't not do something. Don't not act if it would result in the harm. It's um, a, it could be the best, like uh, guard dog in the world. Well, and it could be it could be a you know a resurrector, so to speak, of the golden rule that you know I grew up in the fifties and sixties and seventies, and and early on, that's what we heard about was you know do unto others as you'd have them do unto yourself, and now it's uh, kind of the the opposite. Well, like we just all, I just think we're all masochists then. Yeah. But it's these decisions to your point, Faith, about letting artificial intelligence take over, just I mean to me at least, could have just shift the ethical determination to a different platform. It's like the trolley car experiment, which I'll explain in a second, which is you're on a trolley car heading in one direction and five people are going to be killed. And then there's a switch, which requires human intervention. If you do nothing, five people will be killed. But if you flip the switch, you go to another track, one person will be killed, but you are the one doing it versus letting the train trolley continue. It's, it's a famous thought experiment called the trolley And what happened with so people? They've What's done the research. End? Some people, there is no end. It's just a way to highlight the fact that human decisioning is complicated. Sometimes I don't no, think and that's it, complicated. One per- my God, well, it is. What well, would you it do? Present, it, it it illustrates a d- dilemma. I mean, the, Elon Musk is finding this out with the Tesla cars. You know, they're supposed to be self driving. They're not there yet, um, and that's one of the reasons they're not there yet. Is we can't escape moral and human responsibility for ethical decision making any more than we can claim that aliens are making our robots. Um, it's right. human beings, and it's and sometimes people will ask me, and I when I do some public lectures with being a forty eight, they'll say, "Are you afraid of robots taking over the world?" You know, AKA Terminator style, like you know Ar- Arnold Schwarzenegger's movies. And I'm like, I'm more, and I'm more leery and afraid of the humans. You know, if you look at our past, you know there are enough examples of humans who've done har- and currently, as to your point, Faith, horrible are con- are continuing to do things that are just you know beyond the pale. And now, if those people aren't 
are you know challenged, restricted, or capped from acting on their impulses with this new technology, then you know that will that won't be. That's not a technical problem. That's a social right. policy problem. Right. Right. And so we've managed to not blow ourselves up with nuclear weapons. We've managed, you know, for the most part. I mean, just, there are people who have been blown up. You know, Hiroshima, Nagasaki, great example. But also biological weapons. And that's, again, why I come back to democracy is one of the tools we have to keep ourselves on the track towards realizing the best of what we can do. And anything that's not made, you know, with that kind of loving care is not going to be sustainable. So I, I'm not Pollyannish in the sense that I think this is a technology that can just automatically save us. We have to save ourselves, but we mm -hmm. might have some new tools to do that literally save ourselves, like save our minds, save our stories, save our, our, our insights, and share them with people to pay it forward in a big way. I was just going to ask about sort of the parallelism here. So um, the faith or I, we upload to the mind file. Hopefully we're going to live another day or week, and we're going to continue to evolve and grow and have new experiences. So is the vision, not tomorrow, that you sort of parallel path this, and as the as as being of the human evolves, being of forty eight will evolve in parallel. And then you talked about mentoring from Sasha. Does that also happen? So, what's sort of the interaction between the life events that the human experiences and and that and the social robot evolves into? Well, I think we'll much the way our children start out completely influenced by their parents but eventually they differentiate and and that's okay someone was actually asking me this a similar question about is it okay for being a 48 to continue have her own experiences that being the humans not having is that okay with the experiment um, um, of course it is you know we right. want we don't want to uh, have a clone that just stays static like a you know like a, a fixed photograph right like this is a, this might be a new path for us to continue, you know, our our growth, our learning, our loving, and so we would want and expect being a forty eight to continue to grow, especially if she ever, you know, if she ever woke up. And one way you could talk about that is when something wakes up, there's an aspect of them valuing their life, you know, protecting it, wanting to live on. If and when that happens. Um, I sure hope that we're going to be ready to support, <clears throat> excuse me, you know, the the right to develop, the right to be free. And part of being free is to follow your curiosity and to learn. That's, so that's you mentioned that's children, that's that mm -hmm. we want to give our children roots and wings. And what you just described is that uh, exactly. classic expression brought to Vina. Yeah. So, the, so Vina 48, you could say, is like a mind child that will continue continue on and that's okay that's okay with being of the human i've asked her about this and she says i certainly you know i certainly hope that being a 48 will continue to you know grow and develop in the future and so you could say uh, being of the human has planted the seeds given her the original sort of starter nutrients mind nutrients so to speak information about how she looks at life about memories but those will those will get layered upon just the way our own lives continue to layer. Yeah. You're such an optimist, Bruce. Yeah. I, I, I'm a terminal optimist, Faith, I must say. And I, and I, I've tried to be, I've tried to be more, more of a pessimist, but I feel and see sort of the power of the human spirit and it's, it saves us. It's what helps us, you know, it helps us navigate impossible odds. So I, yeah, I'm very hopeful. Yeah, like um, I'm also. Like, I was going to say, like the Ukraine. Whoever thought, right? Right. Yeah. Can you imagine? Can no. you imagine a comedian running a country no. and be t transforming into a leader? Of, no way. No. I'm um, just. It's in. It's. I incredible. know. It's. It's a miracle. Listen, I found this really inspiring, and I'll tell you why. Because most visions of this kind of subject matter, robots, and you know consciousness and all is always so negative and so dank and so dark. And I love that you think you're bringing something beautiful to the world 
And what I'm hoping is that you have enough patents that somebody's not going to take it out of your hands and do something horrible with it. Well, Faith, I I think there's already something beautiful in the world. Like I think your your conversations also elicit and bring out Aww. something that's interesting and beautiful Thank and you. that's hopeful. And Thank I think you. we're working with gold here. I don't think we're we're alchemists, we're transmuting. That's up for the human, you know, project. Maybe it's well beyond us. But I think we have to make an effort to be who we are and allow other people to show what they know. And um, yeah, I think there's there's no problems that, w- that can sustain sustained human focus and problem solving. Um, it's about persistence and, and, and art and creativity. And, and des- I think we des- have, I was going to say, and desire. Yeah. And I think right. we have that, we have that in, in excess. If you look at what keeps people going in their lives and what keeps people like in the Ukraine, not giving up. So it might be another tool, another avenue for us to continue the human, the human project. Wow. I don't, I I think, don't know. But Bru- thank you so much for having me on. Oh, we'd love it. to have... Bruce, do you have children? I do, yep. How, do. Old, how old are they? They're in their mid-30s. Are they and human children? Or? They're human children, and one, one's an artist and a, and, a, and a social activist, and the other is a technologist and a nurse. So they're... Beautiful. They have, they have really... They're really beautiful hearts, and... They're, you know, they're of their, their generation. So they're trying to put it together, trying to do, do the right thing. I think this is a really important conversation and you're getting people thinking about issues that are profound. And this is going to be a sort of a lifetime journey that you're going to be on and technology is going to get better and we'll learn more about how to create the mind file that is enduring. But the questions about, what is humanity? What is our personal histories? How do we make sure that we honor the past but not be imprisoned by it? All of those things you're raising. And the conversation, I think, is extraordinarily valuable. So the more people who know what you're doing, the more you can disseminate it, I think the better we'll all be. Thank you, Adam. Yeah, I think it's uh, the more the more we are all hands on this, the better that the outcome. We can't do this alone or depending upon a select few people. This is this is a real project where we need we need everybody. So I'm happy to talk with anybody. I love love talking to you all tonight. That's beautiful. Great. Thank you. Thank you. So Addie, of all the people we've talked to, maybe because this this is my favorite subject, of course, I find him to be almost supernatural in his thinking about uploading people into, I don't even call them robots, other, other things and having them communicate onward with your, you know, legacy. Look, there, he does have sort of a preternatural calm and sort of reflectiveness. And sweetness. About him. Yes. But, you know, the interesting part is that a lot of people think about the carbon copy notion of, his mind file uploading consciousness, but the the fact that the social robot will go will grow and develop their own perspectives and values and experiences built on that foundation. That's sort of like a, an artist puts a painting into the world and it's finished. But then other people come and see it and finish it in their own ways. Yeah, I love Bruce, and I think he's really going to create something that people will be less afraid of in robotic form. People are afraid, you know? And I think he will create something gentle and beautiful and contributory to human spirit and soul. And I think that's how we're going to, you know, maybe like robotic life a little better. I don't even think they're robots. I think there's something between us. Maybe they're better than we are. Well, I think that it would be hard to be worse than we are, but I do think you're right. and I. I think that it's what we're trying to do here on Jolty, right? Bring people new ideas, take them out of their comfort zone, but leave them with some hope that we can actually make things better with the right people at the innovation helm. That's our gig. 
Okay. All right. Before Faith and I go, I just want to remind you to subscribe to Jolty, follow us, listen on your podcast platform of choice, tell your friends, make your enemies like you better, and get Jolty out into the world. We thank you. Yeah, beam us up, babies. Ciao. Beam us up. Keep us up. 